with us today. Thank you, uh, Ajmal Moywandi, Chief um, Executive Officer of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture in Afghanistan, collaborating with Aleph and the Prince Klaus Fund. Uh, we also have uh, Vianne Bass, uh, Country Director for Lebanon and Regional Coordinator for the European Institute of Co Cooperation and Development, and Mehmet Balchi, he is the co-founder of Fight for Humanity and the partner for Aleph in his projects in Syria. Um, I am pleased to welcome you all and I do thank you very much, each of you for joining today to share, share with us your perspectives on how including communities in heritage protection projects. Uh, you all include and work with communities within your project and your experiences shared will be very uh, inspiring for us. To begin, I'd like to briefly comment on an international convention, the so-called FARO uh, Convention. The FARO Convention emphasizes the important aspects of heritage as they relate to human rights and democracy. It promotes a wider understanding of heritage and its relationship to communities and society. This convention encourages us to recognize that objects and places are not in themselves what is important about cultural heritage. They are important because of the meanings and uses that people attach to them and the value they represent. The Faro Convention, as you may know, is a framework convention which defines issue, issues at stake general objectives and possible fields of intervention for members um, to progress. So I am sure that understanding uh, this understanding of heritage is common to our way of working and including uh, communities. And with no further delay, I suggest to give now the floor first to Laura Robinson, then uh, Helen, then Ajmal, then Vianney, and we'll finish with Mehmet. I remind you that you have about 10, let's say seven to 10 minutes. Then I will have a few questions for you and we have a Q&A with the people participating in this workshop. Thank you very much. So, uh, Laura Robinson, floor is yours. Thank you. Well, um, while he's just loading it, um, good morning, everybody. Great pleasure to be here. Um, no, good morning. I'm actually um, from ICOMOS. I'm representing ICOMOS, the international body. I um, live and work in Cape Town. I'm a previous board member of ICOMOS. And now I'm the focal point for one of our working groups. It's, the, um, it's called Our Common Dignity, a Rights-Based Approach to Heritage. And it's going to be a little bit different to some of the presentations we've experienced. It's not a case-based presentation. It's a presentation on the work that this group does, which is not case-specific, but it cuts across all the work that, that ECOMOS itself is involved with. There's no, 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 I'll just stand. I'm a bit close to this. So, um, as I said, we have been in existence in ICOMOS for about 10 years as a working group. Um, colleagues, will, you'll probably know that we have several working groups. We have climate change, now climate action, and we have a working group on sustainable development goals. So, this is the youngest one, which is on basically human rights and stakeholders. Just uh, a, few, a few comments, really, to, to set the scene. Um, we base all the work that we do on the um, statement of the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights and the various treaties and conventions that, that guide us all in this kind of work. So not only states, but also communities and individuals are the focus of such rights. We concentrate very, very deeply and very closely on community uh, rights, stakeholder rights and rights bearers in our work. Um, how cultural heritage is understood and treated by people is a fundamental issue and concern for all those involved in heritage conservation. I think that message has come out very, very clearly in the um, conversations we've had in the last couple of days. We are governed, as I said, by, by a set of guidelines and um, these establish the framework <coughs> under which we work. 
by the way, I'll, I'll refer you at the end to our website and, and social media, so there's a lot more information about what we do and, and how we operate uh, contained in there. So our mandate basically is to contribute towards rights-based approaches uh, in cultural heritage management, with a particular focus, obviously, on the work that ICOMOS does. And perhaps just, I'm sure you all know ICOMOS, but just to refresh your memories, it's the International Council for Monuments and Sites. So we deal with the built environment and cultural landscape particularly, and we're one of the advisory bodies to the World Heritage Center. So our working group explores the principles of rights-based approaches. We collect and disseminate information and knowledge on rights and heritage management. And we work together closely with our many uh, national committees throughout the world. I think we have about a hundred, uh, over a hundred national committees in, in uh, throughout or, or most of the continents, bar obviously Antarctica. Um, we also work very closely with our I ISCs, that's our international scientific committees. We work, and this is really important, we, we work very transversally, both within our working group itself and across all the, all the structures of ICOMOS. Uh, so it's non-hierarchical, which is, I think, a really nice way to work. So although I'm the focal point at the moment, everybody is equal in our group. They have equal opportunities to make comments, to participate and suggest and criticize, which is all very important. The work's ongoing and we also adapt according to circumstances and global activities that might require our attention. Okay, so just to touch on, on some of the activities that we do, uh, ICOMOS works a lot with World Heritage. Um, we advise on cultural world heritage for the, uh, the World Heritage Center and of course the committee. And we were, uh, I'm very happy to say, we're quite proud that we managed to contribute to amendments of the operational guidelines in 2019, which has now brought the whole issue of human rights uh, embedded into the operational guidelines. And this particular statement is relevant. State parties to the convention are encouraged to adopt a human rights-based approach and ensure gender-based participation, et cetera, et cetera. We also uh, are very active in the field of gender um, and also alternative forms of gender as in the LGBTQI communities, of course. We've just completed a pilot scheme with ICOMOS's uh, World Heritage Panel and the nomination process where we assessed the upcoming nominations which will be tabled at the committee meeting in Riyadh uh, in September, October. And we made reviews of the human rights and stakeholder issues in those nominations. At the moment I can't say more because it remains confidential till after the meeting, but it was a very interesting exercise indeed. Uh, we do a lot of training. Um, here you can see uh, a training workshop held in the Nordic countries. Um, we work both, we work uh, in hybrid mode, obviously, and um, we, I don't think we've had much engagement with, particularly with the Arab states, but we would welcome the opportunity to engage further. We have a member from Palestine, but I'm not sure that we have any members from many other parts of, of, of the Arab world. Uh, we also uh, led with support and we work closely with the indigenous heritage, the indigenous people's heritage working group, which is very much still under construction. Uh, the intangible heritage uh, scientific committee, the emerging professionals working group, which is aimed at uh, encouraging and mentoring younger professionals who are entering the field, a very, very uh, important part of the work of ICOMOS and obviously our secretariat, etc. We held a, a, our very first scientific symposium, I think that was 21, at the height of the pandemic, and we had a very good audience, particularly uh, in the Latin American countries, which was very encouraging. 
We also have contributed to quite a few um, uh, opportunities and invitations with the UN Special Rapporteurs when it comes to matters relating to cultural heritage and human rights. And um, as you can see here on the screen, we've been looking at cultural rights for migrants, which is a very new field, but becoming increasingly relevant globally as populations are so mobile. Um, we've also been involved in some uh, a conference uh, of the EU, which was convened by Slovenia, and one of our members is a very active member from Slovenia. We've integrated work with the UNESCO Visitor Management Assessment Strategy Tool, and we're just finishing off what for us has been a very, very interesting exercise on heritage and gender, and I, I touched briefly on that. Um, um, gender as it is represented internationally at, at it within cultural heritage and in the past reflecting on what is a very unbalanced situation in, in, in terms of gender representation in cultural heritage formally. I say not, not at community level. We've talked about, I beg your pardon, we've had that one. We have supported Ukraine by uh, contributing to a statement that ICOMOS made uh, on behalf of the international body uh, on the crisis uh, in Ukraine. We've also worked with our Climate Action Working Group, uh, preparing a tool on climate justice, which uh, was just recently launched. We also have a crisis response monitoring working group that is held that is um, convened by one of our board members from Turkey. And we work very closely um, with, with that group, particularly on Ukraine and, and some of the uh, more recent crises. In terms of communication, we've got a, a really active and wonderful group of, of emerging professionals, who else, who run our, our communications team. What we try to do is um, hold regular webinars that are open to ICOMOS members globally, but in fact um, are open to anybody who has any interest in the subjects. Um, they're centers for, it's a forum for debate and discussion and exchange of ideas. They're very vibrant and um, we welcome diverse opinions because that is, I think, part of, of, of what we must be open to. We've had quite a few in 2021 when we were all in lockdown. A couple last year and we are planning um, some more for this current year. And in fact, the next one coming up, we hope in March, will be on the cultural rights of migrant workers that is going to be hosted, um, we think, by ECOMOS UK, the United Kingdom. We also share information through our social media, Facebook and Instagram. And um, you can see there we are. Uh, we are under the ICOMOS website. And at the moment, we communicate in the three official languages of the convention, English, French and Spanish. But um, obviously, the more we grow, we would like to include um, other languages. And maybe we can, uh, if we get some Arabic colleagues, we can start work there as well. We do try to work very transparently and share as much information as we can. As I said, it's very transversal and a very open group. And then I'm going to conclude, and I hope I haven't spoken too long. Um, this is one of the, um, the highlights and focuses that we hope to work on. It's the indigenous people's rights. When we talk about community engagement, I think we all understand that community can be interpreted in many different ways. It can be a group of people who have a vested interest in the site. It can be a community that owns the site. It can be people who just simply relate to it or have been displaced from it. Many uh, in my country, we have quite a lot of displacements in the past. And of course, nowadays, we suffer the same thing globally. And um, we're starting to make links with the Indigenous Peoples World Forum. Um, we hope to continue working and focusing on, on Indigenous Peoples groups in the future. It's, it's a very exciting time for, for us. And um, 
So I'll leave it there, there. I'm sure we'll have more questions as we go on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I'll leave the floor now to Helen. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, as tourists, where do we go? Where is the go-to place for heritage? And museums would be pretty high on the list. As communities, where is the go-to place for heritage? And this is the basis of our um, project. Um, I'm one half of Madison Architects. Um, that's Michael and Helen. Um, our project in Sudan is called the Western Sudan Community Museums Project. And I think it's remarkable that Alif and the British Council Cultural Protection Fund have actually done three very complementary strategic projects in Sudan. And one was with uh, Mark Melo, who's uh, and the um, archaeological protection uh, of monuments in the Nile Basin, another with Sudan Memory and uh, Marilyn, and the documentation of um, manuscripts, uh, newspapers, you know, the extraordinary cross range of um, Sudanese documents. And ours, which was not in the Nile Basin, which looked at the other half of um, uh, Sudan, uh, to the west, where there is uh, uh, a very strong history, geography, culture, um, conflict, uh, culture, um, to do with the Sahel and the Western Corridor all the way to the French end. <laughs> um, okay. So, community museums. Um, what sh who should be talking here, of course, are the Sudanese. They're more than capable of uh, representing this project. And uh, I will just show a very short number of slides. And then the first half of a film that we did halfway through the project that we'd quite like to do a follow-up to if um, there was an opportunity. So this is the thesis that in conflict, in particularly in conflict or post-conflict uh, situations, that one can rethink the paradigm of tourism, whether tourism is in fact the most useful um, social economic driver to fall back on. It's a very 20th, even late 20th century um, direction. Because though tourism can be useful, communities are actually far better placed for building the peace than tourism. And that's before you even begin to factor in climate change and the contribution of tourism to that phenomena. So this little map um, shows where our museums are. So here we are. This was a map. This is a map from last year. So what's conflict and most post-conflict is kind of arguable. But here's Omdurman, uh, here's El Abed, and here's Niala. And that's our three museums. So Sudan is very short on tourists, um, and particularly in the West, and particularly in the red zone that defines uh, Darfur and South Kordofan. So here's our three uh, museums. And when you start thinking about it, museums here really can play an extraordinary role in um, as safe havens for uh, heritage, as cultural meeting places, and I really think, most importantly, as granaries of local knowledge. That's not to say that museology doesn't play a critical role. We often think of uh, community museums as suddenly being sort of down market, or they're included in the back door of the tourism bit at the front. Um, so we have gone out of our way to make sure that the museological aspect of these three museums, despite the fact they're being called community museums, is world-class. We have world-class cases now in Darfur. As of last week, uh, they were finally completed. We have world-class cases in uh, Sheikhan and in Omdurman 
and we also have completely local uh, um, artifacts alongside uh, thousands of years old um, uh, archaeological artifacts in the same museum. So conservation, it's about care and caring for um, uh, heritage is one of the key roles of any museum uh, in any anywhere with any title. So the Khalifa House has been restored, its collections have been recorded, and they've been redisplayed with new cases, with Sudanese histories on the Mahdi period, and uh, we've had to rewrite all the um, rather colonial uh, labels. Uh, and the key is putting the community first. So the first questions, the first people you talk to, uh, you ask, what do you want to do in your museum? And the response that we got back from all of our communities that we talked to was peacemaking. How do we build peace between cultures? It was a kind of universal response. But practically speaking, this means some very um, straightforward uh, elements. So the difference lies in how the museum's organized to work with and for the communities. So shade shelters, furniture, spaces, electricity that works, toilets that are there for the communities to use however they determine. The Sheikh Khan Museum was the first to finish, and even though the exhibitions haven't gone in yet, it is used every day by different communities for uh, different activities. Um, they have volunteers now building who've made their garden. Green heritage is now part of the museum's agenda, so making green space. We've developed exhibitions that champion green heritage on climate change. Um, and these are all being um, picked up by the local youth groups to create programs which are activists. There's really no point in doing a climate change exhibition unless it leads to change. It's not there for aesthetics. Oops. As I said, the most important thing is saving local knowledge. Um, and museums have a very important role to valorize local and rural knowledge, which is marginalized by global organization, urbanization, and then devastated by conflict and climate change. But it isn't just about basket making. These communities know how to look after gene pools of livestock, of crops, of medicine that have been there for thousands and thousands of years and they're the people who are looking after it, who know how to care for it. Museums should also be uh, seeing that as part of their agenda. So it's about supporting farmers. Um, in Darfur at this very moment, we've started a millet festival, a new millet festival in Niala. And in Kordofan, we're working with uh, nomads, um, between the nomads and the Sheikh Khan Museum. Both practically, we're rebuilding a hafia and uh, documenting uh, a culture that is marginalized, um, not just in Sudan, but nomads and migrant migrating um, cultures are marginalized globally, and they're again a very important part of uh, every form of diversity that you can imagine. Uh, the project's been funded by Alif and the British Council Culture Protection Fund. We've had two major partners, um, lead partners, um, Ikram Atha or Ikram Shaja and the British Institute of East Africa. And our key Sudanese partner is, of course, NCAM, or the National Corporation of Antiquities and Museums, who is the body responsible. So I'm just going to show you a short part of our film, which was shot uh, in 2020, just after the first revolution. We've had COVID and a coup since. 
Sudan is a country of rich cultural and ethnic diversity, with at least 500 distinct ethnic groups speaking more than 400 languages. In the past, these distinctions were exploited by both colonial and political authorities, fostering division, inequality and conflict. Today the country is being transformed. A new generation of activists and politicians are striving to open up an inclusive and diverse civil space. History and culture are playing a critical role. يلا المتاحف بصورة عامة عندها أهمية جاية من إنه هي واحدة من المصادر الأساسية اللي بيعتمدها بيعتمدوها الناس لمعرفة التاريخ حقهم. لما أنت لما يكون السلطة دي بس عند أفراد معينين هم اللي بيقرروا ليك أنت إنه ده تاريخ حقك ولا ما تاريخ حقك بيكون دائما في مشكلة بتاعت إقصاء لمجموعات أو في مشا في ناس كتار ما بيكونوا قادرين تورليت للتاريخ ده. Sudan's museums are re-evaluating their purpose and identity, and some are adopting a new community-based approach. What is the most important thing about the society is that the work of the protection of the tourists is not only the responsibility of the members of the museum, but the participation of the community in this matter. The participation of the community is also one of the most important things that it has to do with the development of the culture or the cultural culture. للمجتمعات عموما لان كل من كل شريحه كل مكون للمجتمع يجب تراثه الثقافي معروض بالطريقه التي تعجبه يتم استشارته في هذا الامر ايضا كل الانشطه المصاحبه في المتحف سواء كانت تعليميه او تثقيفيه يتم اشراك المجتمع فيها فبالتالي المسؤولية بتبقى جماعية بين المكون الرسمي والتنفيذي والمكون المجتمعي اللي هو المستفيد الأول من هذا المتحف. Pioneering this path are the community museums in Andaman in Khartoum State, El Obeid in North Kordofan, and Niala in South Darfur. All three museums have worked hard to redefine themselves, using open workshops to collaborate with local communities as widely as possible. The project in the end was a very beautiful idea. It was the first time I heard about the community and the community. And when I read about the concept, I actually have the belief that the local community is the most important تخلق واقعها وما في أفضل من المتاحف to record أو تسجل الواقع ده مع كل جيل يظهر ويوضع بصمته في أشكال العرض في إعادة تصميم المتاحف نفسها في تشكيل النشاطات في الشراكات اللي بيخلقها كل حياة دي بتعكس الوعي المجتمعي، الوعي الوطني، الوعي السياسي في كل حقبة وفي كل تاريخ. The museum buildings have been redesigned to create open, flexible spaces. Staff have been trained in conservation techniques and collections have been catalogued, studied and expanded. دي دي بتكون رسالة بت بت بتأدي إن هي زي ما بقولوا يعني تحفز الناس تشحز الهمم تخلي الناس يعني مفهوم جديد للوطنية للتعايش للتنوع فمشروع غرب السودان المتاحف غرب السودان المجتمعية بيأسس لسودان الجديد السودان القائم على على احترام الغير احترام الثقافات احترام الاختلاف ودي الحاجة اللي احنا بنحتاج لها في الفترة دي يعني. New creative collaborations are reaching beyond the museum's traditional boundaries. Teams of researchers have reached out to remote communities to record and document cultural practices.
and neglected historical and archaeological sites. To be honest, I think the plan is to change the one thing to many things. In my opinion, the history of Sudan, the old and the modern, from the Mahdi and the use of the Mahdi, it was just a thing that was written from a single view. But when we looked at it and looked at the pictures and books, you feel that the story is not just the thing that the people say about one person. The story can be told by a lot of people in different ways, and you don't feel like it's the same thing. لسه ممكن الواحد يكتشف حاجات ولسه ممكن يلقى معلومات جديدة كل يوم. والمتاحف دي بتخليك إنك تتعرف على السودان القديم. في نفس الوقت بتقدر تربطه بالسودان الجديد. وبيتيح لك انك تعرف السودان اللي قدام حيمشي كيف في رايي انا بما انه المتاحف المجتمعيه ولدت متاخر يعني في السودان يعني لكن ولدت باسنانه فغيرت نظره المجتمع للمتاحف نفسها فكانت الناس بتنظر للمتاحف انها حاجه جامده ليست بها حركه ولكن هنا اضافت الكثير Thank you, Ajmal Floysios. Sorry. Great. <laughs> I think that's... This one. This Sorry, one too. Yeah. Yes. I'll try. Yeah, of course. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you. Um, so I'll, I'll present the work of the Aga Khan Trust for Culture in Afghanistan. And I think what you'll see through a number of slides, which I'll try to narrate quite quickly, um, also, uh, keeping in, 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 in line with uh, the mandates that we've heard about, action, action, quick, quick, quick. We'll try to do this very, very quickly. Um, communities, communities in, in, in areas of conflict, prolonged conflict, like Afghanistan, which essentially was, has been in conflict for the past 45 years, coming on to 50 years. And that conflict, again, continues in different manners. So different manners of conflict, whether it's, it's violent, armed conflict, or perhaps what we see more recently through, through economic development and, and the implications of that for various communities. Afghanistan's heritage, the sites we work on are embedded within communities. They're significant for communities on, on, on many levels in the sense that communities still use these facilities, these buildings, these structures for religious purposes, for hygienic purposes, for recreational purposes. So the work is embedded in communities. And when we define communities, I, I appreciated uh, an attempt earlier to, to define them as perhaps residents or those with a vested interest. I would extend that definition, and we have done so in Afghanistan, uh, uh, to students, to people that participate, to professionals, to the uh, civil society organizations that benefit, for, to users, to operators of sites that have been restored, to traders who live and have a symbiotic relationship with these sites and the visitors that come. I'll, I'll go straight into it, if you allow me. Um, so conflict in Afghanistan, prolonged, devastating, particularly in the urban centers, but also in, in rural regions. And in periods of relative stability between conflict, as we've seen in the last 20 years, is, is sporadic uh, growth, ad hoc growth, uncontrolled growth, development, exacerbating conditions, particularly in cities and urban environments, poverty, uh, uh, a weakening, dilapidated infrastructure, congestion, uh, 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 uncontrolled growth, uh, uh, degradation of the environment, traffic, uh, et cetera. The, this also exacerbates the economic and the living conditions for communities. Uncontrolled development, of course, uh, encroachment on public land, uh, sporadic uh, construction, uh, quite a bit, and also the alienation of the public from urban space in the urban sphere. And more recently, of course, is, is economic depression, poverty. So 
direct engagement on project sites with communities, as, as we saw, uh, 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 speaking with them. Now, communities, of course, in conflict environments, uh, they're incredibly resilient, resourceful. They've withstood decades of violence and brutality. And, 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 uh, uh, but they're also traumatized, they're deeply suspicious, uh, 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 and there is a division of course, particularly in a country like Afghanistan that has multiple ethnicities, multiple languages. And so it, it's an approach which requires quite a bit of delicacy. But the collection of information, it's, it's, it's essential when we work with communities. Baseline socioeconomic surveys, gathering information, understanding their condition, how they live, and what are the needs, essentially. To devise a program of conservation which doesn't only look at restoration of sites that are important to people, but also direct investment in their environments, improving their envir environments, and also improving the associated livelihood. Participatory planning, engaging communities. One of the main aspects of, of, of a dissolution of a state through conflict is the relationship between the public and the institutions that are meant to serve them have been lost, they've been fractured. And so going through planning processes uh, also informs and raises awareness with the public about what, they're, what they should be expecting from the institutions that are meant to serve them. And then designing and planning projects, for example, in the old city of Kabul, in the old city of Herat, uh, planning interventions with the information and with the analysis in mind, and provoking transformation. Transformation becomes essential, again, through conflict, through degradation, through years of lack of maintenance, properties tend to uh, uh, fall apart. And again, properties that are where people reside, where people, Sorry, I keep it like this. Where people reside, where people uh, uh, you know, have religious ceremonies or where they pray or where they bathe, hammams, et cetera. Sorry, did I just turn it off? Oh, there we are. Uh, so providing direct benefits to communities and also indirect benefits to communities. So urban armature, the old city, the transformation of an old city, uh, particularly when it comes to sanitation and health and, and the environment and drainage. This is by extension to the, uh, extending the benefit of conservation and by extension to the wider community. In the old city of Herat, for example, more than 10 kilometers or 10,000 meters, linear meters of drainage and access improvements have been done in the old cities in both in Kabul and Herat. And again, Historic structures, historic monuments embedded in a growing community, informal community that does, has basic services, and then planning for those services, creating commun uh, uh, communal spaces, for example, the, the, the gardens, because these developments on the hillsides of Kabul tend to be quite sporadic and go straight up the mountain, but there's no sense of community, there's no interaction between people, and creating green spaces actually brings them, in, in many ways, connects people, and also these spines of services. And in the spine, we have access, we have drainage, and we also have the creation of little terraced gardens where the community can engage, employing locals, creating massive, I mean, over 20 years, we've created more than 3 million mandates of, of labor for uh, the workforce that we engage. Training a workforce, coming into a country after prolonged conflict means that the skills necessary to restore monuments, complex monuments, simply don't exist. So one has to start from scratch. So training a workforce and sustaining that workforce continuously through projects becomes very important. Building conservation skills. And also, when we talk about communities that are engaged in, in conservation, also a community of expertise, a community of experts outside of Afghanistan that also participate in the restoration, in this instance, of a late eighth, early ninth century mosque. And also creating islands of, of nature, reviving historic landscapes, again, embedded within a uh, perhaps partially historic, but mainly uh, a recent community. Engaging government, providing technical assistance to government, helping them help their institutions to manage urban infrastructure and also historic sites. Training and educating young professionals. It's, it's quite important. More than 3,000 young students from Kabul University and Kabul Polytechnic University, Herat University, have benefited from conservation programs, either through direct engagement or by coming through. Enriching the learning process, having guided tours of uh, uh, our projects, not only for architects, but also for archeologists, which is quite important, and also providing internships in the field for people to engage working with artists in civil society, engaging them in advocating for the preservation of heritage within Afghanistan has is, is, is been essential. 
uh, Afghans have an innate and deep sense of culture and history, especially living traditions, and, and helping provide uh, more awareness in terms of built heritage and its significance is quite important. Training, teaching vocations to both young men and women. More than 9,000 uh, trainees have come out of the vocation programs in, in, in Kabul and Herat and Balkh in three provinces where we work. Supporting the management of historic sites, opening them to people, making sure that they become spaces for everyone, spaces of interaction, spaces of engagement, but also commercially viable so that they can be maintained and operated over time. 11 million visitors have visited the three public parks that we've created in Kabul. And this is on a Nowruz, so it's actually in populations mixing, different populations from different backgrounds. War tends to separate people. It tends to create uh, alienation between communities. And in this instance, places like this bring people back together. It shows that they all share a humanity and share uh, aspirations. And also nurturing the environment and, and, and ecology within a site that we've created. Providing basic literacy to groups that cannot, do not have access to school. And also reaching out, uh, having public exhibitions, having exhibitions related specifically to cultural heritage and the work that we do for younger generations. Celebrating intangible culture. These gardens, these sites become places where people celebrate, where they come and they express themselves. Having educational programs for young Afghans and also of course, uh, recreational opportunities and playing opportunities for children is, is always essential. Uh, training young musicians. We've had a music program where 2,000 young Afghans, men and women, have also been trained in, in traditional uh, uh, music. And providing equal opportunity. This is why we're there. We engage because through our engagement, we advocate. For the next generation of young Afghan professionals, putting words into practices, ensuring that people have opportunities to work, inspiring people to do better. Uh, I, there's this amazing quote from His Highness Tagha Khan in the context of, a, of a, uh, uh, a speech he was giving in the Center for Pluralism in Canada, where he said, post-war environments, developing countries, are an, opportunity, are an opportunity for us, I'm paraphrasing, of course, are an opportunity for us to do our best. It's not a place for mediocrity. It's where we do our best, not our worst. Creating hope, seeking continuity and adversity, which is what we do now through our work, and ultimately working towards a better future. Thank you. Okay, Vianney Bass. This one. Assalamu alaikum, bonjour à tous, good morning to everyone. The main purpose of my uh, presentation today will be on how an on the jive, on the side job training, commence qu'un chantier école, can be not only a way to protect and renovate uh, heritage, but also a great way to, uh, to integrate the communities uh, with a broad understanding of what community is about. So I'll be focusing on what we have been doing in, uh, in Lebanon, just a few, few slides about our organization, uh, which is an international organization uh, operating in around 20 countries, and what is at stake, the DNA of ICD is uh, vocational training, formation professionnelle for the youth, uh, with the, uh, the vision that uh, technical training, vocational training, is actually a good way to bring back the youth into society, and we've applied this to heritage innovation. In Lebanon, we're conducting uh, operations throughout the whole country uh, in, in three key areas, which are education, training and access to employment, and entrepreneurship. Uh, when we put in place some, some projects, we do not only pay attention to the training itself, but we want to make sure there are employment opportunities afterwards for the youth. Okay. Uh, what about heritage innovation? So we, we, it all started uh, after the uh, explosion in the port of Beirut in uh, August 2020, um, where there was extensive destruction and damage. Uh, and actually, Alif uh, played a, a critical uh, role at this, at this time. They uh, funded uh, the uh, roof covering of more than 100 ancient buildings which basically saved them from, from, from rains and windfalls. 
Uh, second point about the situation was the, uh, the key administration organization in charge of uh, history protection, which is the DGA, Direction Générale des Antiquités du Liban, uh, which has got limited resources. Therefore, we, need to, we needed to, uh, all organizations had to uh, help them. They could not, in terms of resources, funding, and manpower, uh, do enough on their own. Uh, when this happened, we actually Lebanon rediscovered that uh, this country where there used to be lots of technical skills uh, in terms of uh, history, those skills because of the civil war, because of history, had gone and there was not that many people able to really uh, remember what was at stake when you think about preserving or renovating an old building. And there was a major risk of losing uh, the intangible heritage uh, of this country. And I know that will be one of the discussions we're having afterwards, how to protect not only the tangible, but also the intangible heritage. Uh, so over the last couple of years, uh, we've uh, been working on four different projects in this specific uh, renovation part, heritage renovation. Um, those are three different buildings. Uh, and in terms of uh, inclusiveness, uh, even though we are talking about uh, house renovation, basically, we've uh, had quite a few uh, ladies who've been able to join our trainings. I will go more into details about the training that we've put in place. Um, and also, it's a fact that part of the, of the youth that we have been trained are not only uh, Lebanese, but also uh, uh, Syrian and some Palestinian refugees. That the first uh, uh, house that uh, we uh, renovated, uh, it was a house where basically we, we, we started and we really felt there was, because of the interest of the whole community around, there was really an important field uh, that we could dig upon a little bit more. And that's where actually from there on we decided to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to move on to the three other projects. Heritage renovation, it's not only about the, the technical skills, uh, the carpentry, the, the lime, uh, la chaux. Uh, it's not only about uh, the, uh, the, the ironing, la ferronnerie, it's not only about the ceramic. It's also a lot about what happens to the community around. And this has been discussed by some of the previous speakers, but we have faced exactly the same situation in, in the sense that Many people used to uh, walk around, many people from the community used to walk around all those historic buildings actually without paying any attention to them. And by engaging into the, a renovation project, actually what we felt was one of the upside was the community progressively rediscovered its own heritage and became involved. And actually you need that community to be involved, if only because renovating a building takes a lot of time and is a bit of a noisy, and dusty uh, nuisance for the, for the neighbors. But beyond that, it was also a way for them, again, to become part of the whole project. One of the, again, uh, key uh, outcome that we want to do in all of our projects uh, in, in the tr countries we're operating, but in this project likewise, is to make sure that the people that we train, the youth that we train, uh, end up having a, a job, some employability outcome. And we have found that amongst the uh, 12 or 13 different kind of training that we're having in, uh, in, this, in Lebanon, this one, Heritage Renovation, was likely, was most likely one of those where the uh, employ employability rate was, was the highest. So uh, uh, yeah, 85 of the eight, 90 trainees that, we, uh, that went through our, our project and now have a job, either in other renovation, old house, renovation project or another kind of, uh, of building uh, project. Uh, we pay a lot of attention in the trainings also, not only to the technical skills, but to the light skills, the soft skills. Um, a lot of those youth have been traumatized by, uh, by the war, either the civil war or the, or the explosion in the port of Beirut for the Lebanese or for the civil war, for, for the war in, uh, in Syria. So there, there, there is a lot of work to, to, to do to make sure they feel more proud and comfortable about themselves and be able even just to interact you know, in, in, with other members of, of society. Um, 
by working in these traditional houses, we connect with our heritage and we anchor ourselves more into our homeland. It's been, again, one of the very positive upside that we found in those projects is how much the youth involved uh, not only liked being on site for many months, but also enjoyed very much rediscovering their own, uh, their own heritage. Uh, the current building that we've been uh, starting uh, working on over the last uh, three or four months has been funded by, uh, by Alif. Uh, it's a project uh, which is uh, located in, uh, in the beginning of Hamra, for those of you who know, uh, who know Beirut. Uh, we plan to train around 75 young uh, Lebanese and some refugees in 10 different trades. Um, it's, it's pretty large buildings. Uh, the history is as follows. I mean, it's it's a 150-year-old building, at least for the for the ground floor, uh, and it has been transferred of around 60 years ago to the Maased, uh, to a, through a WAF to the Maased Association, which is a charity from uh, uh, from the Sunni uh, Confession in in in, uh, in Lebanon. It is important from a historic point of view also because it hosts uh, the largest uh, uh, library of uh, Islamic and Quranic book in in Lebanon. Uh, that's a picture of the building in the 1960s. It's, uh, for those of you who know a little bit the region, it's uh, what you call the traditional uh, triple arcade uh, design. Uh, with um, yeah, We have a red, red tile roof and some, some painted ceilings. Uh, this is what makes this uh, building interesting from a historic point of view. Some of the... Some of the, uh, of the um, of the vitro, uh, that's the outside garden. Uh, some of the uh, some of the roof with some uh, Baghdadi uh, uh, roof uh, covered with stuccos. So the restoration has been ongoing. We just started a few uh, few months ago. Uh, a lot of work has to be done to protect uh, the the building, including eternally. This was where the uh, the thirty five thousand books uh, were stored. They have been removed, they are stored in a safe place. Some of them need actually some dedicated uh, re restoration and will uh, come back afterwards. One of the commitments that we're having when we are dealing uh, with the, the owner of a house is that after renovation, the house uh, remains or becomes a, a place where people from the outside can come. Okay? It it's cannot be <coughs> a business, it needs to have a, a role for the community around. So this is what we started, including the roof, where we remove the tiles uh, and are going to change the whole uh, carpentry there. One of the interesting things is we've uh, rediscovered some really ancient uh, know-how, uh, such as the carpentry, where people who had been trained like 40 years ago, including by uh, uh, some compagnon uh, du devoir, and whose knowledge had been lost, basically, and now, 40 years later, they're sharing their knowledge to a younger generation of, of uh, young Lebanese. And just to... to <laughs> the, the music woke you up, suddenly. Uh, just to end on my brief, uh, a two or two and a half minute uh, video uh, on the different projects that we've had with direct testimonies from the youth that uh, we have trained. <laughs> مساواة حرفية الجهد تحدي جدارة مهنة اتقان قيادة عائلة فرصة فريق انجاز التزام امل الهدف مغامرة اتقان مهنية موهبة تعلم كمتدربين قدرنا نحصل على خبرة كتير كبيرة بوقت قصير يمكن بمكان تاني كان بدنا كتير وقت لنحصل عليه اليوم بعرف انه قادر احصل على فرص عمل بأي غرشة خاصة انه المثلي لا لتعلموا هاي المهنة من متدرب صرت اليوم قاعد للفريق على الأرض هالشي زاد ساعتي بنفسي كتير وساعدني لأعرف كيف انجح مش على سعيد فردي إنما من خلال فريقي من 
2020 لليوم أخذنا على عاتقنا مش بس إعادة أحياء تراث بيروت المعمارة إنما كمان المهن التقليدية يلي كانت على وشك إنه تختفي دربنا وعم درب شباب وصبايا على أتقان هيدي المهن من خلال التدريب أثناء العمل أكبر تحدي كانوا بعده بالنسبة لقلبنا إنه نرفقهم بمسيرة الانتقال من إنه يكونوا متدربين ليصيروا عمال ماهرين على الصعيدين التقني والشخصي لهالسبب تدريباتنا هي منا مجرد معلومات ومهارات مكتسبة إنما بتتضمن مهارات حياتية ومتابعة وتوجيه يومي لأنه من آمن إنه شباب اليوم هن الحاضر والمستقبل We go. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I invite now Mehmet Bachi to reach the floor, and I just would like to precise that as we began quite late, uh, this workshop had been extend extended up to um, 12.30, so we have one half an hour more. Merci. Okay. Oh. You have plenty of time for lunch. <laughs> My name is uh, Mehmet Walji. I'm the director and co-founder of uh, Fight for Humanity. Uh, we are a very small organization based in Geneva, but our team has got um, yeah, a lot of experience, at least each of us, 15 years of experience working in the conflict situations especially on uh, humanitarian advocacy towards our non-state actors. So uh, our team is uh, basically we have been operating in our previous capacity in Middle East, Latin America, uh, dealing with the uh, armed groups or de facto authorities who control territories or populations. So uh, we um, are operating currently in Iraq, Syria, in Myanmar, also in Colombia, uh, we did also some work in Senegal and Cameroon. But we are a very young organization. I mentioned many countries, but these are small projects. And we have an uh, important project with Alif. Uh, and we are also, said we are, uh, as Fight for Humanity, are peace and human rights and gender uh, organization. So my slogan today will be inclusiveness, inclusiveness, inclusiveness. <laughs> it is not <laughs> so. Uh, it's very uh, it's important. Also, do no harm, do no harm, do no harm. I think this is also that uh, uh, concept we have to uh, take into account. I can also say that during these two days, I have been listening to many uh, development actors, and also cultural actors, but. Uh, uh, but I see the link, I think the humanitarian and this world can benefit from each other. I think the humanitarian have got different sensitivities and uh, worked in many uh, uh, sensitive uh, conflict sensitive con uh, settings which can help a lot. So at least I see from my perspective coming from humanitarian and now also dealing with the cultural heritage uh, is very complementary for me. Uh, before uh, starting a little bit explaining our project, uh, I would like to, the, the, our project with Alif is happening in Northeast Syria. Northeast Syria, I'm talking about 30% of uh, Syrian territory, which is almost, I say almost non-controlled uh, by the government. It's controlled by uh, the facto authorities. But it's an, an, it's an region where uh, the armed conflict is ongoing, where uh, the security is a big issue for all operators, humanitarian or other. Uh, we have uh, ongoing conflicts, but we have, so we have Syrian government presence. We have 
US presence, let's say they have French, the international coalition against uh, ISIS presence, let's say, uh, if make this very short. And we have uh, Kurdish forces, we have uh, all Syrian democratic forces led mostly by the Kurds. So uh, we have Russian presence, where you travel and you can cross everybody. You meet Russians, Americans, Kurdish, Syrians. So it is very, let's say, uh, schizophrenic situations. So you have to really assess uh, every day uh, the security when you travel, when you uh, move from one place to another place. In this context, Alif accepted uh, to fund uh, a project. It's not a unique project. I know Alif is also uh, supporting another project in Raqqa uh, to rebuild Raqqa Museum. I'm not going to talk about it. It's a great project, uh, but I would like to talk our activity. But uh, uh, I see also last, since yesterday, we are, I think we all agree there is no mystery anymore. We have to include the communities. We have to work the communities. So uh, now, uh, of course, there is not uh, one size fitting everywhere the same way. Each community, its context is different. And uh, now the question is how and uh, <coughs> we include communities. In our cases, uh, the, well, then the definitions of communities are also uh, different. You have to see what is, uh, but in our case, really, if I say that we included communities, I will be lying. But we included local actors. We haven't developed anything ourselves. We went there. Uh, the first thing we did with Alif, it was there were three uh, uh, three phases or st uh, for this project. First, it was assessment mission uh, that Alif supported. We went uh, on assessment mission. We have been working in North Syria for ten years in humanitarian issues, but for this project, we asked Alif to support us for a special assessment mission on the needs of the cultural heritage. Uh, the first was that we went on the mission and we uh, conducted an uh, assessment mission. We came back with a report that we prepared together with, I can say, with the local authority, de facto local authorities, who has their own structures, uh, law, de facto law, de facto uh, directorate, in different areas in Northeast Syria. So we uh, went there, we discussed with them. We, so we came up with uh, a lot of information, with a, a lot of uh, urgent needs and uh, uh, action plan. So we came up, and this is what the first phase. The second was uh, to do the first emergency projects. So the first emergency was there was an old palace Nawada Palace, dated 4,000, 4,500 years old, and where the archaeologist has worked, and uh, uh, a lot of data was collected, but the building, the ruins are still uh, uh, some protected, uh, or needed to be restored. I will not restored, but to preserve. Say the, the, so I will show a short video on this Nawada Palace work, then I will continue uh, with uh, my presentation. تل في بلدة البيدر تل أثري ومهم جدا بالنسبة لي وأي مرأة أو أي إنسان في هذا البلد وهذا الموقع أيضا ملتقى لجميع المكونات الموجودة في هذه البلدة يعني وحوالي البلدة من كرد وعرب وسريان حتى البناء الموجود حاليا حاليا الموجود الناس يسكنوا نفس البناء التقليدي يعني تفضلتم انه هذا بناء نفس البناء اللي حاليا نحن ساكنين فيه يعني بناء تقليدي يدل على حضارات حضارتنا القديمه والجديده هذا الموقع كان يعرف قديما باسم نابادا كان زؤاميه كبيره خلال الف الثالث قبل الميلاد طبعا مر الموقع بعده مراحل 
منذ الف الخامس قبل الميلاد وحتى وصولا الى الفتره الهلينيستيه يضم هذا الموقع العديد من المعالم الاثريه منها القصر وكذلك المعابد منها معبد اي بي سي ومعبد دي بالاضافه الى عده مرافق اخرى بعد الأزمة السورية تعرض الموقع للعديد من الأضرار الناتجة عن الأحوال الجوية والتي تتطلب منا التدخل من أجل حمايتها وترميمها كونه من أهم المواقع الذي يحتوي على الأوابد الأثرية في المنطقة فقمنا في ترميم موقع البيدر الأثري ترميم موقع البيدر الأثري في بناء جدران المنهارة وترميم اللوحات التعريفية وقمنا بتجسيس الموقع في المكان القديم تجسيس القديم قمنا بتأهيله تجسيس جديد مفيد للاجيال القادمه لانه الاجيال القادمه هي راح تكون نفس طريقه الاجيال القديمه راح تمشي على طريق الحفاظ على هذا الموقع الاثري just to tell you uh, this uh, Nevada Palace is in Haseke, it's like 10 minutes from the prison where there are 10,000 allegedly ISIS members detained. So the palace were in it, and of course, the, there is no international tourism. Before the conflict, there was a lot of interest in this place, and, uh, in the, the, uh, and it's very close to the communities. But the only beneficiaries are the communities of this of this work. So we didn't include maybe in the, uh, I'm telling you because it was uh, right, but we didn't include really community in this planning. But we work with the communities. So this work was done with the community workers, done with the local partners, local experts. So it was totally. I mean, the local actors were involved in its restoration. Is is theirs, and they are protecting. They are taking care of it. It has two enemies, uh, this palace. One is ongoing conflict. The second enemy is climate change. This is the climate change definitely needed every few years to be uh, somehow maintained uh, and need to be really, uh, any heavy uh, rain can damage it uh, severely, but we alleviated a lot of really um, I mean, stabilization work, and uh, it's very needed. So the uh, the second um, phase, or the uh, or still in this project, I will maybe come back to this. Um, uh, this is still in the part of the first phase. Uh, before the conflict, uh, there were more than ten archaeological missions in this area in northeast uh, uh, Syria. And uh, in 2011, when the war started, uh, there was a kind of call. I don't know who. Uh, the archaeologists decided to leave all this. And they left behind. And the, I mean, the, 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 I mean, the departure was so quick. And really, they, they left a lot of uh, artifacts in the, their uh, places and with hope to come back soon and to continue their work. After 10 years, there's still no conditions for archaeologists to go back and to conduct their work. So they left uh, behind thousands of artifacts uh, to be still uh, documented. Some of them are documented, other not documented. So, uh, but the local authorities uh, decided together with archaeologists to bring them to uh, all this material in one uh, warehouse. Uh, in these conditions. So there were two warehouses where you had uh, thousands of artifacts, material kept in these conditions, and uh, we uh, supported Alif. We uh, prepared uh, and, repaired, uh, and prepared um, two warehouses where uh, to sort out and also further 
to document them again. So this is the emergency phases because this is very important to. Uh, so indeed, we, uh, this, uh, we uh, after the preparing the warehouses, uh, we started the uh, documentation uh, work, and the documentation work was uh, done by locals, uh, also with the support of the Berlin National Museum, uh, in order to do it according to the international standards uh, that can be uh, also you know, uh, uh, yeah, traced uh, easily if anything happened or so in. in in this uh, project, we um, documented around um, 8,000 objects. So we sorted out, we, uh, yeah, uh, sorted out um, uh, 8,000 uh, and 2,500 almost of them are exposable. So we can have easily have a uh, museum of this. Uh, so but now they are kept uh, in a safe place and uh, we hope that uh, one day we can have uh, conditions to have also uh, uh, yeah, a museum uh, with all these objects. So uh, one other pillar uh, of this project was to raise awareness. So we, uh, it was a pilot project. We trained uh, teachers and the teachers uh, uh, did sessions with uh, children. We also produced an kind of booklet where we said uh, our culture is our, uh, or they call it, not us, <laughs> our culture is our <laughs> identity. Uh, and this, we have done uh, thousands of, I mean, thousands of students benefited from this um, awareness raising uh, campaign. We did also, uh, another component was capacity building of the local de facto uh, security forces. Uh, on the fight against illicit trafficking. Because one of the issues in, in Syria is uh, a lot of uh, illicit trafficking uh, is happening. So uh, there is <coughs> uh, this local security forces um, have, since the conflict started, have <coughs> sorry, captured 18,000 pieces from the smugglers. So currently there are 18,000 uh, coins or artifacts, uh, different uh, uh, are, uh, and therefore we said it's very important to, uh, it can be questioned or de facto security forces, uh, but we put the cultural heritage in the middle, the interest of the uh, heritage in the middle, and we therefore we uh, also supported um, this uh, pillar. I will go back, sorry. I wanted to talk to, uh, last minute, come back, sorry. I wanted to talk about this. Um, one of the uh, pillar of the, not pillar, one activity of the project was the curation of the uh, these rare mosaics, Roman mosaics, so uh, dated 2000 year old. These mosaics were found in the north, let's say, north Aleppo, uh, in Shur Tahtani, uh, where there are a lot of archaeological, uh, it is an archaeological site. By chance, uh, they found in 2017 these like, uh, and huge mosaics. There are 83 pieces of them. This is one of them. Uh, and they were taken out uh, with the experts and kept. But when the conflict in 2019 happened in this area where they were uh, found, uh, the local authority decided to move them to another city, Kamishli. And during the transformation, uh, they, they have so a little bit damage. So we did with the uh, support of uh, international expert provided by Alif, uh, Professor uh, Roberto Merde. I have to mention him because he really supported. <laughs> Uh, as uh, because he's a specialist and he really uh, so we did during corona all this happened during corona time almost so uh, the, I also to mention it that uh, if you want to 
talk about the added value or the local capacity, local uh, existing or enhancing local capacity, I can say that this work could not have happened without them, even during the corona time. We were not allowed, we could not travel, they were watching. Somehow they uh, conducted all this work uh, almost during the corona time. Okay. Therefore, uh, but if I come back to the community engagement, I think, um, of course, as I said, there's no one size fitting everywhere. Of course, uh, we all agree it's a key. And uh, in, especially in, in, in context where you have uh, an ongoing armed conflict, where you have limited access to the area, where you have a lot of uh, actors, uh, not only security, also the local actors. So you have to really analyze very well the stakeholders. <laughs> who is who? Who is deciding what? And uh, uh, it's very important not to put people against each other or communities against each other, that you, that you give uh, a sense that you are supporting one community, or ignoring the other one. So the communication is key, involvement is key. Uh, therefore, the transparency is a key element in this sense. So therefore, we, uh, I give just an, an example in order to stop one minute. <laughs> when we started with the local authorities there, these discussions, and we involved them in also the budget, uh, we to build the budget together of these activities, uh, and uh, they were telling us, look, we are 10 people in this office. We all will work somehow. Uh, so uh, give us money, we will divide among us. We are a community, and then if you select one, two, three, four, five, according to the, the um, skills, some of us will be uh, excluded, and we will have internal problems. No, because they, uh, they wanted to have kind of uh, consultancy. And then they would like, uh, uh, and then, of course, it was not easy. But we have to really sort out this, that uh, we also um, respect donor, in this case, Ali or others, requirement. Uh, and to, uh, so therefore, we were transparent. We were negotiating <laughs> between the blanket. At the end, we sorted out that all of them somehow are beneficiaries, direct beneficiaries. To finish, in this project, minimum uh, 60 families benefited from, thanks to the work uh, opportunities. Uh, so I stop here, but I'm uh, happy to take. <laughs> Thank you, I will open the discussion now, please. Uh, uh, Thank you. I, I ha first have a few questions for uh, the members, and then we will open the last 10 minutes to Q&A with the public. So first for uh, Vianney, uh, thank you very much for this uh, inspiring uh, presentation. The first question would be, what are some successful strategies that have been employed to make sure that traditionally marginalized members of the community are represented? So you mentioned, obviously, uh, Lebanese students, but also refugees. So how... Could you just go deeper into the success successful strategies that have been uh, employed in order to, to include these marginalized people? Thank sure. you. Yeah, when uh, there is a, a thorough selection process, when we look for, for trainees participating to our trainings, uh, this process is based uh, upon uh, the motivation first, that, that's key. Not the skills, not preview skills, but motivation, and which means capacity to go all the way through the training um, which is important to us. Then, uh, when we go through the selection process of the different trainees, we make sure there is a, a, a good uh, gender balance as much as we can in those fields, and also that we do not exclude uh, the most uh, vulnerable population, which can include, uh, indeed, uh, refugees. Um, otherwise, what we have seen, unfortunately, in Lebanon is actually that uh, we have uh, more and more Lebanese people becoming vulnerable, and. Uh, 
who have been joining also uh, more and more of those uh, of those uh, projects. Uh, then there is a lot of work to do in terms of uh, not only technical skills, as I mentioned, but also in terms of soft skills, light skills, and uh, spe especially the, uh, the the population which has gone through quite a few traumas uh, definitely need a lot of uh, psychological and uh, uh, and so social uh, support. Uh, that's basically what we do. It we do it throughout the training, and then. When uh, after the training is done, they, we follow them up to one year uh, to to ensure there's the smooth integration into society, both again from a job and, uh, point of view, but also from a soft skills, a light skills point of view. Thank you very much, uh, Helen. To you now. Um, obviously, Sudan is a great example for I mean working with different uh, communities. Um, how do you account for potential factional division when working with all these communities in order to, to build a consensus? Especially when we see that you, you have experience in, in uh, different parts of the country. <coughs> um, it's not our um, choice, it's what the communities want to do. Um, the different factions want to have a non-factional space. We've tried to create what works operationally as a civic space, <coughs> What's also required is a very good museum manager or director so that they ab adhere to a very clear mission. And then the mission is peace building. Thank you very much. This is yeah, a, a very a good example about how, how the communities can express themselves to, to what they want and what, not what we think and to impose anything from our own point of view. Um, for Ajma now, uh, sh should we conciliate universal and local community approaches? If you can uh, respond to this, to uh, what Ellen said, uh, also because in your own context, you have so many, I mean, you have also different communities uh, together. So how do you conciliate the universal, if we can speak of uh, th that kind of uh, vision, and the local uh, communities' approaches in, in your own project? If I understood the question correctly, it's, it's um, how to integrate the aspirations, perhaps, of communities into, into our projects? Yeah, I mean, communities coming out of that kind of conflict or, or, or economic depression um, require work. They require direct, impactful engagement through work. So that's, of course, the, the, the best way, is to employ members of the community in the work we do at different scales in different areas. That's important. Second is to look at, through speaking and dialogue and engagement and even pre preparing surveys to understand what their basic needs may be. Is it uh, hygienic? Is it services? Is it uh, you know a better environment in terms of access or, or or drainage? And so we work with that. Is it sanitation? Is it waste collection? So direct, impactful interventions, I think, enhance engagement, enhance understanding, and willingness as well. It's uh, you know the, the, there is a massive sense of entitlement. Many communities in Afghanistan are aid dependent. They have been for generations, in fact. And, and for that reason, I, I, I think um, engagement through an initial method like that actually goes a long way then opening up discussions to much more complex issues, such as identity, such as cultural heritage, such as the preservation and the maintenance of it. Thank you very much. Speaking about inclusion, uh, Laura, what role does immaterial heritage or intangible heritage with also living heritage play in ensuring inclusion from your perspective with the different project you have described? Thank you. Okay, that's a, quite a broad question, really, um, and one could spend a lot of time on it. One of the, um, just before I, I try and answer that question uh, intelligently, one of my particular interests is intangible heritage and the... Um, the meaning, the additional layers of meaning that intangible heritage place on physical place and uh, how they enrich our understanding and, of course, make that place important to the communities whose history and intangible heritage the place actually represents. So uh, intangible heritage and human rights, I think, 
you know, you could, uh, it's, it's uh, possibly what I've just said might, might help to start answering that. It's not particularly explicit in the work that our working group does. Um, we do, ICOMOS works quite closely with intangible heritage, but of course there's a convention on intangible heritage as well. Um, and, and often the lines are quite blurred between what we do as people really engaged in place and what intangible heritage and practice and traditions uh, go alongside. And my own continent, Africa, I think, like obviously many parts of the world, is particularly rich in in intangible heritage and place making. So that relates directly back to both um, communities and the indigenous peoples groupings that I referred to very briefly. So it's something that is we are always mindful of when we consider human rights, but it's really something quite broad in terms of our understanding of what um, makes significance on, on, a, on a cultural level. I think that all sounds a bit abstract, but I, I tried to answer what was a very general question, <laughs> and um, perhaps people will have some more comments. Thank you. I think maybe on this matter, Vianney would uh, intervene. You need to drink first. <laughs> down the, the topic on um, immaterial yes. uh, heritage. Yes, and living heritage. Uh, the, the, the topic that we see indeed is uh, we cannot only uh, restrain ourselves to, uh, to, to, to the tangible part. And uh, the whole question is what does intangible really uh, is about. Uh, what we've seen is the fact that uh, if you want to ensure a, a long-lasting long -lasting impact on the renovation of a, of, of a historic uh, place, uh, you need to think not only about the action itself, but then what happens to this uh, place afterwards, and therefore you need to go to uh, re-give some kind of a sense of purpose to uh, to the building itself, where, where this is when you touch upon the, the intangible part. Uh, intangible part also is the uh, uh, the legacy that previous generation had left to, uh, to the people, to the neighborhood, to the trainers that has been lost, especially in uh, in eras where there has been some conflict, uh, where history sometimes has been uh, wiped out, where the uh, uh, where, where communities have lost any sense of uh, of belonging to the historic buildings being there, so this uh, requires actually a, a, a lot of time. Um, this requires some kind of a storytelling as well about uh, why is this this building important, and to make sure then that the uh, communities around can. Uh, re uh, become again the owner again somehow of that um, of that building and then uh, finally maybe in terms of intangible things uh, there is the whole uh, uh, something difficult to measure but which which we have seen which is the 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 feeling of of pride of being really people being really proud about what's happening there uh, and somehow uh, en enabling people uh, in the community to uh, to join see touch. Uh, and and again uh, become some kind of the uh, the new uh, fostering uh, family for this uh, for this building. Thank you. Before yeah, opening the the floor to the public, do do you have question between uh, panelists? Uh, please do. Just as we were speaking about intangible heritage and memory and meaning, possibly I. I don't think I referred to spiritual relationships that communities <coughs> have, both present and past. And I think that's come out very strongly um, in the, <coughs> the examples that have been discussed generally across the board that do re relate to sites <coughs> of worship and sites of spirituality. And that is a particularly strong link, I think, both with intangible heritage and, again, the living spiritual practices that communities still engage with. Thank you, Sudan. By opening, yeah, I, I saw two questions. Mr. Menin said, yeah, you, and then Isber, and then, okay. <laughs> I was gonna sort of <coughs> posit the question by an example, actually. Um, in, in the community museums that we've been talking about in Sudan, we did ask at the beginning what what, what kind of pr uh, program would bring everyone together. 
And the first project that they decided to do was about marriages. So in, in Kordofan, you have about 120 different cultures of defined in different ways. But the one thing they share in common is marriage, because one of the things that happens in the three museums is where the nomads who go north and the nomads who go south come together in the dry season. Nyala itself actually means the dancing place. And uh, the three museums now uh, are seen to be places where they can celebrate the shared common heritage and tradition. Because they're Arab culture, they share a tradition of marriage, even though they're different cultures. And so one of the first exhibitions that were done was a marriage exhibition in which everyone showed different types of marriages um, and different musics associated with that, different foods associated with it, and different names from different cultures of the different foods in the same ceremonies. So this showed how people traditionally who were divided by their different traditions of nomadism or farming were actually sh shared a common thing that they discovered together in the museums. And that became a, a very big and very popular focal point uh, for the museums. So as an example, actually how a museum, not a spiritual place in itself, could celebrate the traditions of, mu of, of different shared heritages. Uh, and one of the other aspects of the museum was that we invited people to bring objects to give to the museum so that they would have memories of their traditions in the museum itself, and that was one very successful as well. People brought things from swords, from battles, and objects from many different periods. So just an example, sorry, of how the museum museums work. Thank you very much for this beautiful uh, testimony example. Uh, so yeah, Isbra had a question, then we have, we have six more minutes and four peoples, which is one and a half minutes uh, answer <laughs> and question. <coughs> So thank you very much, everyone. I just would like to give some ideas, also some experience working on in, uh, including civil society. I mean, we uh, Heritage for Peace, we, we, we funded we, since four years with the support of Alif as well, an initiative called uh, Arab Network of Civil Society Organization to Safeguard Cultural Heritage. And we have now a platform of almost 40 NGOs in countries in conflict. I mean, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Libya. I just want to say that the policy, f there is a big policy failure. We need to think, and all the policy makers, how to think about really more work about civil society. Civil society doesn't exist before in this country, outer, uh, in the authoritarian countries. I mean, the relationship between civil society <coughs> and the dictatorships, regimes, it was very complicated and it didn't exist. And now with the conflict, the civil society became more and more important to fill the gaps on humanitarian aid in, uh, in a lot of uh, 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 also things. So we need really uh, to think, all the funders, the policy makers, everyone, to think about policy. And we need to think about empowerment. The civil society that we are working, they need a lot of things. They don't get any support because they are not prepared to get in touch with the international community. They need the basics. Project management, we did, we did a lot of training of how do you make project management, how you make a, 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 a proposal. They don't have that. The international community will not trust civil society because they don't have any records of projects before. So we need to think about giving, even the funders and the people who are working in, 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 uh, in this sector, need to give a little bit of confidence to those people. With a couple of thousand of euro, they can do a lot. We worked in Raqqa with the support of Cultural Protection Fund. With just a few couple of thousand, the people, they were able to do a lot a lot of work because they were the people who needs or we identified their needs. Any project should be in collaboration and in discussions directly with the people. We not got from outside with a lot of uh, ex people outside came and pr uh, provide uh, projects. We need really to talk to the people and understand what are their need. And <coughs> to finish, uh, there are a lot of things which I would like to share, but we need also to consider the refugees community. A lot of refugees communities working and in, 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 uh, in, uh, are displaced. And in, in, in Turkey, we, we work with, uh, uh, with the refugees community of Palmyra. And we need to think about how we bring heritage to those communities. Now with you, Patrick, we are trying to do it in Jordan. But 
also heritage com displaced people, the displaced people, they need to consider heritage. And we need to think about using heritage as income projects for those affected and displaced people, too, for their well-being and for increasing as well their self-esteem. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. First, I saw a question here. Yes, sir, please do. Yeah, for Mr. Uh, uh, Jamal. I was wondering if you could put the work that you did into historical context when it comes to the changing of the regime, uh, because I didn't understand yani, when when and, and what is the difference between the pre-Taliban and the post-Taliban? Yeah. That's, that's, that's one. And, and the second question related to that <coughs> is how do you place yourself between authority and community? Thank you. Thank you. No, uh, intentionally the distinction I didn't want to make of this is how it was before and this is how it is now. We continue significantly. The only... Uh, 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 difference is probably scale at some level intensity in terms of the resources now available for work in Afghanistan and also with music education. That's an activity that we no longer do directly. We do it indirectly, we, we do it uh, with the diaspora community, which is another major com aspect of the Afghan community. There's <coughs> something like six million Afghans outside of Afghanistan, very interested in Afghan culture, very interested in knowing what's happening in the country. We've set up information platforms to keep them aware of developments, and we also then engage them with, with other media uh, or online-based activities. Um, so. Most of it continues. The scale is different. I mean, some of the images of uh, the last images of the of the people, the uh, my colleagues, the Afghan professionals, those are very recent images of people continuing to work in Afghanistan, and it's important. Your second question was differs. I mean, it, uh, on some level, in different projects, depending on on the level of engagement through authority or community, we become a bridge. So we transfer uh, the concerns of communities to authorities, or we address them in our projects by engaging government as well. In other instances, we advocate on behalf of government, for example, when there are issues about sanitation and the community's responsibility and waste management and keeping areas clean, then we make sure that we can advocate. So it's, it's, it's both directions. Sometimes we, we, we fill the gap, sometimes we make the connections, and other times we implement a lot of this through our work. Well, fulfilling the duties of the authorities is very different. I mean, authorities provide are meant to provide different levels of service. I mean, as an international organization, non-governmental, what we do is demonstrate potential, demonstrate possibility. Afghan capacity, Afghan sites, management of those sites, operations of those sites. So we do work closely with communities, with institutions, non-governmental, but also with government. It's, it's clear that's part of our job there, but we don't replace government, and we certainly don't do the work of government. I mean, in the context of our projects, to demonstrate the potential, we do. I mean, some of, you know, you, you'll have access, I'm, I'm sure, online to a lot of our projects, and a lot of these projects are innovative in many ways, especially when we look at having reuse projects or transformational projects like an industrial site we're working on Kabul. The architecture is, is quite innovative. Again, keeping in line with the guidance and the mandate of the organizations, you know, mediocrity is something we try to avoid <laughs> as much as we can. Thank you. If, if you allow me to keep you hostage for five more minutes, we have one question from Aparna from Ikram, and then uh, this gentleman wanted to ask a question in Arabic to uh, Ajmal, and uh, you will translate maybe the question in English for the audience, and then you can answer in Arabic because it's translated for anyone. Is it okay? Oh, sorry. Okay, so you you will okay. Sorry, my my bad. So um, you will you will respond in, in in English, and it will be translated for him. Okay. So first, Aparna. Very quickly, I would like to ask. Thank you for excellent presentations in this panel, and I would like to ask Ajmal um, about the metrics that you have in place to measure peacefulness, especially. Um, in, in, in view of the transition that happened uh, after the Taliban uprising. So what metrics, how do you measure peacefulness 
uh, through the heritage uh, based projects that you have outlined and if you can you know share some of those metrics with us I saw your presentation before, so I understand how important metrics are in, in the work that you do. For, for, for us, w we don't work in those terms. I mean, we provide, like a metric, would be <coughs> 11 million people in a public garden of 12 hectares over 13 years uh, from different constituencies of, of, of Kabul. Kabul is a city of four and a half million people, so 11 million people really represents you know, a cross-section of, peop uh, of peoples. We do monitor data, we do know who comes, the number of families, the number of women, the number of children, so the demographics, we, we understand who comes. But the metrics of peace, I mean, I could say that there's very little violence inside the garden, perhaps. <laughs> uh, we don't have recorded instances of, of major conflict within such sites. Uh, there's excellent interaction. I mean, you saw the photographs of people really congregating, uh, especially on, on, on festivities and celebrations, but also on a normal, you know, an average summer month uh, on, a, on a weekend, you have 10, 12,000 people in these sites. So they're, they're in proximity. Yeah, no. Uh, no, there is a challenge, but I don't get caught up in the temporalities of it. The reality for the past 20 years has been thousands of men, women, and children in public gardens. That's the reality. Now, a reality also since October of last year is the prevention of women coming into gardens. But I don't see that in an historic context as, as, as continuity. What I see as an historic context by being in Afghanistan for 20 years is the reverse side. That's the potential. That's what people want. I don't get caught up in those kinds of things, and, and it's not my duty. We, we, we keep the place, we engage the communities in the work, and we advocate and advocate and advocate. And we do advocate significantly about issues such as that. I mean, we don't remain disengaged. We certainly don't take it as a fait accompli, a little bit of French that I know. So we, we, we engage. And we Thank you very much. So the last question will be for this gentleman in Arabic too. Helen, sorry, my bad. And then obviously we'll go all lot for, for lunch and you can uh, go on discussing and asking uh, people, so. Sorry, speak for Arabic. I'm Ayyub from the Mosul. يمكن أهم سيشن بالنسبة لي في هذا المنتدى هو هذا لأنه يجذبني دائما إشراك المجتمعات في هذه المواضيع وللمرة الأولى أسمع بمصطلح المتاحف المجتمعية رغم أننا نطبق هذا الموضوع في الموصل من خلال افتتحنا من خلال المؤسسة التي يديرها متحف خاص بالمقتنيات التراثية التي تبرعت بها العوائل في الموصل ووصل عدد القطع أو المقتنيات ل 600 قطعة وأيضا في الأسبوع الماضي أشركنا المجتمع في عملية تنظيف وترتيب المتحف سؤالي ما هي أو هل هناك يعني مرجع لهذا المصطلح أو هذا الموضوع ومتى بدأت فكرة المجتمعات أو متاحف المجتمعية بشكل علمي وكيف يمكن تطوير هذه الأفكار أين أجد هذه المراجع Thank you. So the, the, the question was, was about um, a community. Uh, uh, this gentleman is from the Museum of uh, Mosul, and he's asking, and he said also this is the best session and the best workshop in the whole uh, conference. So thank you very much. <laughs> and um, yeah, you can an an answer about th this community museum uh, regarding uh, his question for Mosul. Um, Within Sudan, the, the concept was invented in Niala by the communities in Niala who um, gave their objects to the Darfur Museum when it was set up as a peace gesture in the middle of the wall. So it was um, the beginning of something that we picked up on. But really, um, uh, the whole thing is driven by listening to what people say. The big, the blessing or the silver lining of COVID was that we could not get, for love nor money, any international trainers into Sudan. We had to 
use Sudanese to do everything. Um, and it was uh, a real lesson for us that actually uh, now we say whatever part of the project we're doing, uh, you shouldn't need us. This part of the project uh, you should be able to happen without us. We are there um, simply to help things along, um, to suggest suggest things, to advise. Um, but really, it's it's your museums, it's your culture, it's your heritage, it's your decision what you want to do, it's your grandmother you want to take to the museum, it's your children on Saturday afternoon, it's your grocery shop, uh, it's your uh, souk, it's your treasure house, it's your place where you can celebrate weddings. It's totally, utterly yours. And thank you very much. This is the best word for the end. Thank you, <laughs> everyone, for attending. And please keep on networking during lunch. Thank you very much, and see you later. Bon appétit.